guests, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my singular honor and privilege to invite His Excellency the President of the Republic of Kenya and Commander-in-Chief of the Kenya Defense Forces to address this special sitting of Parliament. I thank you. Your Excellency, please address the joint sitting of the Houses of Parliament. Asante ni sana. Tapadhali tuketi. The Honorable Speakers of uh, the National Assembly and Senate, Honorable Members of the National Assembly and Senate, by the grace of God, it is my pleasure to address this inaugural session of the 13th Parliament following the August 9th general elections. It is important to note that we have made very positive progress. This parliament has recorded the highest number of re-elected members of parliament ever. In the National Assembly, a record 193 members have been re-elected, 50 more than were re-elected in 2017. While in the Senate, 17 senators have been re-elected. This confirms the increased confidence of the people of Kenya in their leaders and institutions affirming the maturity of our democracy. Another milestone is the election of women legislators elected into single-member constituencies. In this year's election, 29 women were elected members of the National Assembly, six more than were elected in 2017. This is a manifestation of the growing confidence in the contribution of women leadership in decision-making, in our governance, and in our political institutions. I am certain that this positive trend will continue into the future. It is also instructive that the same confidence in Parliament has been shown in the executive. In 2013, the president was elected with at least 25% of voters in 30 counties, 34 counties in 2017, and 39 counties in the just concluded elections. Again, further demonstrating the deepening pluralism and inclusivity of our democracy. I therefore take this special opportunity to congratulate all of you on your election in the last general election and the subsequent nominations of our nominated members of parliament. The confidence demonstrated by Kenyans in us and our institutions should inspire us to raise the bar in our service to the nation and accountability to the electorate. It is also my singular honor to congratulate our speakers, the Honorable Moses Wetangula and the Honorable Amazon Kingi, for overwhelming confidence of members to preside over the respective houses of parliament. I also congratulate members who have been elected to parliamentary leadership positions and wish each one of you wisdom, strength, and success in steering our legislative affairs. We gather here on the tranquil side of a competitive election where we all came to grips with the turbulent energies of political competition that characterize our uniquely Kenyan brand of democracy. It is true, this election 
was an intensely contested election. Nevertheless, that it was peaceful and democratic again confirms the coming of age of our democracy. I submit to you that the fact that the election was so close is an indication of is an indication that what unites us is always much more greater than what divides us. With the support of Kenyans, we have dislodged ethnicity as the central organizing principle of our politics, thereby retiring for good the ethnic mobilization and personality cults, together with their culture and practices of exclusion, discrimination, patronage, tribalism, and nepotism. We took this assignment further with a paradigm shift of issue-based political leadership anchored in credible platforms, feasible programs, and transformative commitments aimed at positively affecting the well-being of all Kenyans from the bottom up. In summary, and this only happens, by the way, in Kenya, the sitting deputy president became the candidate of the opposition. And the leader of the opposition became the candidate of government. And as things would be, the opposition candidate won the election and became president. <laughs> and the president became the leader of the opposition party. <laughs> That's the beauty of our democracy. <laughs> and it only happens in Kenya. In the process, we also affirmed the sovereignty of the people of Kenya as the ultimate decision makers as envisaged in the Constitution. I promise to lead an administration dedicated to the just and fair government of all Kenyans in order to deliver a Kenya for everybody. I commit to be the loyal, hard-working, devoted president of every Kenyan, and my administration will serve all without regard to any distinction, real or imagined. Certainly, service delivery under my administration shall be impartial, regardless of political affiliation or voter preference. Kenya is our home and we remain united as one strong family. For these reasons, I want to persuade you that the legislative agenda I stand here to prosecute deserves the bipartisan support of this House. My administration is pursuing a transformational program that offers a uniquely all Kenyan moment which calls for unity of purpose in the legislature. We are committed to serving all Kenyans in all wards of each constituency and all counties in every region throughout the Republic of Kenya. After all, we all serve the same boss, the people, and their sovereign interests are our operating principle and purpose. I will run an administration that is open, that is transparent, and my administration will rely on oversight from this House to make sure the public gets value for every cent invested in every policy, project, and program. Consequently, I ask Parliament to consider a mechanism in the standing orders to facilitate cabinet secretaries to articulate government agenda, explain policy, and answer questions on the floor of the House to enhance 
executive accountability to the people of Kenya through their elected representatives. On this matter of oversight and holding government accountable, my administration commits to restore the place of parliament in our democracy by respecting the autonomy and oversight authority of parliament on the executive. Equally, I am a firm believer in democracy and the rule of law. That is why my first executive action when I took office was to undo a legacy of acts and omissions that had incrementally undermined the independence of the judiciary. For avoidance of doubt, the judiciary is an arm of government just like parliament and my administration will be intentional in respecting the constitutionally mandated systems of checks and balances. It is in this spirit that I will be seeking additional resources to support the bottom-up scaling of justice and empower the judiciary to acquire capacity and develop the infrastructure needed to more efficiently adjudicate and expeditiously conclude corruption cases, commercial disputes, and all other matters that today are a huge backlog on the judiciary. Honorable members, to implement the pledges and commitments set out in our plan, my administration is committed to investing in the requisite enablers and infrastructure to provide a sound foundation for its execution. These are interventions intended to create a conducive environment for effective, efficient, and sustainable realization of our national transformation. We are on a mission to dramatically scale up productivity in agriculture and make sure that every Kenyan farmer, fisherman, and pastoralist contributes to sustainable economic growth by contributing to adequate and affordable food, generating greater incomes and producing the raw materials required by the agro-industrial and manufacturing value chains. This will boost Kenya's export performance and create millions of jobs. Consequently, we have been deliberate in our efforts to restore sanity and introduce greater responsibility in the management of public resources. One significant intervention is the resolve to abandon consumption subsidies in favor of supporting and investing in production. This is why we have made available fertilizer to our farmers at cheaper rates of 3,500 per 50 kilogram bag down from 6,500. We are exploring further mechanisms to bring these prices down. We have an obligation to redeem our pledge to our small traders, the hawkers, the mamambogas, the border borders, that every person who sells any good or service gets to work and earns a decent livelihood enough to place them on the path to wealth through saving and investment. The hustler economy has to flourish and form the foundation of broader economic transformation while catalyzing the widening of the national revenue base. Our agenda here is to take necessary measures to create an enabling environment for business people to thrive and decriminalize enterprise. Affordable credit makes a huge difference in the rate of business growth. Access to affordable credit is like a magic formula. 
the current credit reference bureau approach of blacklisting data is zero sum punitive and has arbitrarily locked millions of business out of the credit system it is time to shift the formula to a credit scoring system which allows lenders to apply customer segmentation and at the same time end the stigma of blacklisting. We have held productive conversations with operators of the Fuliza and Mshuari platforms on the modalities of reducing their lending rates. I am happy to report today that yesterday our engagement finally culminated in undertaking by the platform operators to reduce the cost, the cost of credit by 50%. And this is a significant step towards unlocking billions of shillings needed to spur economic activity by once again expanding financial inclusion. My administration will allocate resources every year to the Hustler, to the Hustler Fund from which micro, small, and medium enterprises can access affordable credit to start and expand their businesses. I promised yesterday that we will leverage on technology in the management and disbursement of these funds. And shortly, we will be bringing to this House the legislation and the regulatory framework to operationalize this fund. There is tremendous opportunity for this House to fully take up its role in resolving the systemic issues of limit to access affordable homes and affordable financing. This administration will unlock housing for the nation by doing a couple of interventions. Number one, we will work on the provision of land for affordable housing, both public and private. And number two, we will provide access to affordable and stable financing for those engaged in social, affordable housing across the country. These two measures will allow, will allow us to undertake mass housing production and thereby shape our approach to urban development and spatial planning, which, unlike before, will deliver sustainable and inclusive human settlement. I also wish to express our intention to bring to this House legislative proposals to provide a framework for a housing offtake plan, which will create incentives for developers to invest more money into our housing strategy and on the strength of guaranteed offtake of completed units. To actualize the enabling infrastructure, we intend to take the following steps. A public-private partnership funding framework is envisaged for large capital projects. In order to achieve our target of raising access to water from the current 60% to 80%, Kenya shillings 500 billion is required. Government can provide this gradually, but the private sector can mobilize it all at once. We will thus adopt a public-private partnership framework by entering into water purchase agreements with investors. I have already instructed the PPP unit at Treasury to work on the regulations that will facilitate the mechanism like we have in our energy sector for investors to work with us on a formula 
under a water purchase agreement uh, instrument. This way, we will achieve water for all in less than a decade. Concerning electricity, we shall facilitate the development of innovative and effective modalities to provide better off-grid systems, including enabling consumers to form small cooperatives for that purpose. And in health, we are bound by duty to take measures to make universal health coverage a reality and liberate Kenyans and their families from the threat of harrowing poverty that stalks them every time a family member falls seriously ill. In our plan, and through your support, we will restructure our primary health system so that we put more resources into promotive, preventive, and early diagnosis. A key driver of this realization is the National Health Insurance Fund, whose restructuring is not only necessary for efficiency, but also enables it become a fit for purpose social insurance scheme that caters for all, including those suffering from chronic diseases. Digital technology has become a critical player in economic growth. We will capitalize on existing technology and innovation in the public and private sector to distribute the Hustler Fund as promised in our plan. I call upon financial institutions and our young people in innovation to participate in the digital economy by redesigning their products to serve the goal of empowering millions armed with grand ideas and are only waiting for the funds to finance their dreams to reality. Honorable speakers, honorable members, I have news, and it is not very good news. Our financial situation is not very good. For Kenya to grow to an upper income country, we need to invest at least 25% of our GDP. Our current national savings is below 10% of our GDP, why, which translates to an investment savings deficit of 15% of our GDP. Over the last decade, we have sought to close this gap with public borrowing. This year alone, we budgeted to borrow 900 billion to finance both development and recurrent expenditure. You're all aware that our total collection is 2.1 trillion, which is only enough to pay debt and to pay salaries. Everything else we have to borrow. The government members should never borrow to finance recurrent expenditure. It is not right. It is not prudent, it is not sustainable, it is simply wrong. We must bring ourselves and our country to sanity. Over the next three years, we must reverse this and go back to the situation where government contributes to the national saving efforts by keeping recurrent expenditure below revenue. To this end, I have instructed Treasury to work with ministries to find at least 300 billion shillings in this year's budget so that we can remove it because the market cannot sustain the kind of borrowing we are doing as government. Next year, we will bring it further down so that by the third year, we have a recurrent 
budget surplus. This we must do, members, because it is the right thing for us to do. On the revenue side, I am committed and determined to ensure that our tax system is responsive to the needs of the economy. It must be equitable, efficient, and customer friendly. The economic principle of equitable taxation require that the tax burden reflects ability to pay. This is best achieved by a hierarchy that taxes wealth, then consumption, then incomes, and lastly trade, in that order of preference, so that those who are wealthy and have the capacity to pay should pay more, and those at the bottom of the pyramid should pay what is proportional. This is best achieved by our tax regime that is different from our current tax system, which falls way far short of this. We are overtaxing trade and undertaxing wealth. We will be proposing tax measures that begin to move us in the right direction. We will also work with the Kenya Revenue Authority on a culture change to make it a people-friendly, customer-centric organization. I am of the view that we should rename it the Kenya Revenue Service in line with the pro proposed transformation. The very large government borrowing requirements has also undermined the business sector contribution to national savings and investment efforts. These measures outlined above will also address the problem of government crowding out the private sector from the credit market. It will encourage banks to go back to lending to businesses and also bring down interest rates so that the private sector can also contribute to reducing the savings investment deficit. In many countries, social security and particularly pension systems contributes significantly to the national savings. Our current social security infrastructure, both public, that is the NSSF, and private, only cater for people in formal employment, thereby excluding the vast majority of working Kenyans. There is no retired Kenyan today who is living on their NSSF retirement benefits. The meager current contribution of Kenya shillings 200 a month adds up to 72,000 over 30 years. There is no rate of return on earth that can grow this into an, ad an adequate pension. I mean, we, we just have to be honest with ourselves. You cannot pretend that you are saving by saving 200 shillings and it happens across board. Not surprising, many Kenyans scrambled to provide for themselves by investing in the 50 by 100 plots of land, thereby exacerbating the problem of land fragmentation, price inflation, as well as, as, well as land fraud. We intend to overhaul our social security infrastructure to make it inclusive, to encourage to encourage those excluded to save, I will be proposing a national savings drive to encourage those in the informal sector to set up their retirement savings plan. For every 
two shillings saved in the scheme up to a maximum of 6,000 a year, the, the government will contribute a shilling for every two shillings saved by the private sector. Meaning that every Kenyan who will save 6,000 a year, the government of Kenya will give them 3,000 shillings. As part of the response to the ongoing drought, we have embarked on distribution of relief supplies to 3.5 million Kenyans who are affected by drought in 23 arid and semi-arid counties. The ultimate solution to the drought cycle in our country is mitigation of climate change and its adverse effects. We must act urgently to keep global heating levels below 1.5% degrees centigrade, help those in need, promote the use of renewable energy, and thus end addiction to fossil fuels. Honorable members, I know the contribution to the National Government Constituency Development Fund has made in making life better for our citizens. Having served Having served in Parliament for 15 years, before and after the establishment of the National Government CDF, I know the difference it makes is monumental. I believe there is a way CDF can be aligned to the tenets of the Constitution. In this regard, I also extend to heart that both houses should also be adequately resourced for oversight duties. With regard to the Senate and its constitutional mandate, I believe the two houses should work together to set up the Senate Oversight Fund. This will be used to provide oversight of the millions of resources that are sent to counties. Honorable members, the people of Kenya rightly expect much of us. We have our work cut out. This is our chance to achieve real change by working together to make Kenya a land of equal opportunity for all where every Kenyan is proud to call home. Let us all play our part in the service of our employers, the people of Kenya. I will be making other statements going into the future. I will make my statement today short. May the good Lord bless you and God bless the great people of Kenya. Thank you.